uh, we will be holding the uh, first Fresh Waterways Advisory Board meeting of 2021 via Zoom. Um, and so let's go ahead and call this meeting to order, 2 p.m. And first, I'd like, just like to uh, make sure we have a roll of everybody who is present at the meeting. Um, so let's see, it's uh, here at uh, Bob's house is Steve and Bob Fowl, Phyllis Brown, Grant Safer, uh, who else? And then Greg, who else do we have online? Alicia's here. Nick's, Nick's here as well. And Sarah. Is Scott online? He is not as of yet. Okay. All right. And so Sarah- Looks like we have a guest. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say, do we, is, are there any uh, guests or um, anybody else online? We have one citizen and that is Don Williams. Hey Don, Bob, Bob, good to hear from you. How you, how you doing? Just, just visiting, nothing special. Hope it's all okay up there. <laughs> okay, so the first thing um, we're going to first uh, welcome uh, Mr. Williams. I'm uh, glad to have you here. Uh, we will have a uh, public comment um, section towards the end of the meeting, and we'll make sure to uh, call on you at that time. Uh, first thing that we have on the agenda is approval of minutes of the December 7th, 2020 meeting. Uh, do I have a motion um, to accept those as written? I move that we accept them as written. Bob Fowl. Bob Fowl uh, moves, and do I have a second? Uh, Phyllis Brown, second. Thank you, Phyllis. All right, so the uh, minutes are approved um, as written. Uh, next, we have city planner report, Alicia. The only thing I have to report is that I did get in touch with Department of Fish and Wildlife finally last week on the 29th, Portia Lee called and she said that um, the removal of the tree, if it was not already done in Fish Hook Canal, it was okay to go ahead and do that. Okay, um, so then the next thing would be for the city to uh, contact the tree service to have them come out and do it. We don't have anybody yet on the uh, corporation or advisory board that would be able to get the boat out and go do that. It's too big of a it's too big of a tree for us. We would need to call um, Nathan, schedule a time for him to come out and help us with it. And I did run into him about three weeks ago, and he said, "Just let him know." It's only six inches in diameter. It's not a big tree. But okay, I'll get in touch with Nathan. Okay. Well, we can take the barge out and dip it off. Yeah. Why don't we do it? Well, we got some crazy weather coming up right now. Um, well, if you guys, if so, if we have some members that are will, I'm willing to go out. Um, do we have some uh, grant? Are you willing to? If it's not raining, you know, I'm available, boats available. It's Today just, would have been a good day. <laughs> well, and it's only a six inch tree and probably okay. an hour and a half. We'll have it uh, on the deck. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, Alicia, if you just want to hold off on that and uh, the board members, we'll see if we can get together and we can make that happen. If not, I will email you and then if we could get uh, Nathan, um, um, out there, that would be great. So just kind of on hold for now, if, if you're okay with that, Alicia. That's fine with me. I will hold on until I hear back from you. Thank you. This is Bob, Alicia. A little clarification. I guess maybe I'm confused. We have a permit when we're going to take a dangerous tree down. And that permit runs for several years yet. 
if a tree is in the water, it was my understanding that you don't need a permit. You just, because it's already a, it's a fallen hazard, you can take it out of the water. That was my understanding. Is that correct or incorrect? Under the permit, we still have to contact them and tell them what we're doing and where it's located so they can approve the, the work to remove a dangerous tree or a fallen tree. Okay. We don't have to get a new permit. We just have to have them aware of what we're doing. Got it. You will notify the homeowner that's affected? Uh, did I get an address on that? I think I did. I can I can notify them, yes. Okay. How long is that uh, awareness good for with the, with the homeowner? Is that, they, we have to do it within 30 days or? Reasonable. Did you hear that, Alicia? Something about 30 days. Yeah, yeah so this is Steve. I was wondering, how long is that notice good for, Alicia, once you send it to the homeowner? Do we have to have it done in a specific period of time? We can give them a time frame of, say, 30 days and tell them that it will be done sometime within that time frame. I don't think we have a, a specific time that we have to do it within unless we tell them that. Oh, well, let's not yeah, then let's not to give them a time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Phyllis. That's great. Weather permitting, we'll we'll get out there and take care of it. And then, Alicia, if you could um, just send me an email, let me know that um, that that was taken care of. So then, uh, we'll uh, we'll make sure that once that notice has been issued, then we know that we're clear to go out and take care of that tree. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you very much, Alicia. Do you You're have welcome. anything else for the city planner report? Not at this time, no. Hi, well that worked. I'm sorry, say again? No, that worked. Um, I was trying to get on through the link that I had and it was saying it was an expired meeting. So uh, I had Sarah resend it and this, this link worked. So. Sorry, I'm late. Gotcha. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Fresh Waterways Corporation, uh, they haven't met. They still have not had a meeting. So we'll go ahead and, and uh, just put that they're still on hiatus. Okay. So um, next on the agenda, we're moving into the old business. First is membership renewal. Um, so, uh, thank you, Grant, for your application. I have that and I will get that submitted uh, to Sarah. And then um, also, um, Greg, uh, when you uh, have a moment, if you could get me your application, I'll send that as well and we'll get you two um, uh, back on the board. <clears throat> yeah, I'll get that to you sometime Continue. this week. Great. Thank you, Greg. Oh, uh, yeah, he's going to be on new business. Mm -hmm. And North End Grand Canal Park project. Um, so I guess as it, I know the last time we've talked about this, you know, many, many times, Nick, and we know that the next uh, part is the uh, getting it presented to the city residents and open for discussion or comment. Um, just wondering if there, if the city has heard anything about continued Zoom meetings or if the governor, what his plan is for opening up uh, public meetings again, or are we still on the continued hold? Well, I think Scott. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Scott. I was just going to say, I know for the next month at least, uh, everything is going to still be done on Zoom, both our council meetings and city meetings. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll obviously let everyone know the minute that we get moved up in those phases, the, the county will probably be moved up on a whole. But I would, to be honest, just between us, this is not an official statement, but unofficially, I would think we're going to probably be doing Zoom meetings until somewhere in March, March, April. Okay. All right. All right. That's good to know. Um, 
So on the North End Grand Canal Park project, um, I went down there again. This is just for everybody's info. I went uh, down there again and um, looked at that and um i i just i just really hope that when this is presented that um the citizens really uh jump on board with uh understanding what it's all about and what it's going to be you know um that it's not just about beautifying it but it's also about taking care of the uh, uh the dredge or the restoration or the demucking of it and how that can improve um everybody's uh experience on the waterways for residents and they can take their boats and how it's just going to be a nice little area so um nick if there's anything that you know that will be coming up that it would be on the city agenda for any reason um i would appreciate if you just shoot me an email because i would definitely like to make sure that i'm there so i can hear what folks have to say about it or maybe what their what their thoughts are Oh, of course. I, I expect any movement as we move forward will be done in coordination with the Fresh Waterways Board uh, as opposed to separately. I think that's the best way to go uh, moving forward is uh, together as a group. All right. And also just one one little question that I had about it is, is that um, I can't remember. It's been a while, but um, that ditch that goes you know through the city into the grand canal was that part of the project nick uh doing any kind of restoration in there negative that is a, a separate and independent component all right is that something that the city is working on well uh the short answer is no um the little bit right. longer answer is uh, we intend to, um, you know, with the, the storm rate modifications that were adopted, um, the next step for us, the next big step for us is to establish a, a stormwater master plan, which will definitively incorporate, you know, uh, maintenance activities up there. Uh, and so that over the next 10 years, you know, should, should be improved dramatically. Okay. What is that creek formally called, or that ditch called? Technically, it's called the Oyhut Oyhut Ditch, Oyhut Creek. I don't I don't know if there's a distinction between the two. We've had biologists say that it's a, a creek. We've had biologists say it's a ditch. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, my understanding of its source or its roots was that it was originally constructed to get water to the golf course. So that's that's my understanding of the uh, basis of that. Okay. All right. Yeah, it was just my wife and I, we drove by uh, both, you know, I say a couple parts of that today. You're coming into Ocean Shores, you know, they're from the 109. And then we drove by when I went to go look at the uh, uh, at the North Bay area, drove by by North Beach Realty. And uh, definitely quite a contrast of how much water is in the creek at those two areas. So it's a creek now, in the summertime it's a ditch. It's a ditch. <laughs> yeah. So, but that kind of, you know, I knew we were having this meeting. So, you know, I wanted to drive around. My wife enjoyed just driving up and down streets aimlessly. So, um, all righty. I appreciate that, Nick. Thank you. Um, all right. So, does anybody have anything that they'd like to talk about with the North End Grand Canal Park Project? Any, any other board members? Nope. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to the new business. Uh, first that we have is we do have a, a membership application um, from Joe Hubachek. Joe, um, is, he was at, at the last meeting and he uh, uh, talked a little bit about the um, waterways, the uh, dissolved oxygenation level and about the fish that were in the waterways. And he has a great interest in being part of the fresh waterways advisory board i've talked with him on three different occasions in great length and i think he would be a good uh pick to be on here he has a wealth of information you can see on his application of things that he's done there on the uh, 
how do you say this? Sislu River, Sislau River, Sislau River in Oregon. And he's worked with fish and wildlife extensively and doing bass tournaments. And um, so I think he would definitely be a, a good uh, pick to be on, part, uh, on our board. So did everybody get an opportunity to review his application? Yes, and I'm wondering if any of the board members have any questions or comments that you'd like to to put forth or any concerns. Well, I, I think I would tend to support him. He's obviously an avid fisherman. Uh, he had his own sporting goods store. So he knows fishing, he knows the people in the fishing industry. And that's one of our goals is to get this thing fishable again. And I think he adds an element that the rest of us probably lack. And that is the knowledge of fish, fish habitat. Bass. Yeah. So I think he would be a good pick personally. Phyllis? Oh, I agree. I, I think I think it's time that we get someone with some different views on how to do this, a lot more knowledgeable on the fish habitat than what I am by any means. So I would support him totally. Okay, thank you. Grant, do you have any? I think we're looking for somebody to be a uh, interperson between uh, our water system and the National Bass Society to get some bass in the lake. And uh, he might, sounds like a good candidate. Okay, I agree. Yeah, very good point. Greg? Oh, yeah, he looks good to me. I mean, new blood's always good. good. Yep. All right. So we'll go ahead and we will put uh, Joseph Hubachek to a vote, his application. Um, and all those in favor of Joseph Hubachek on uh, becoming a member of the Freshwaterways Advisory Board. Uh, please say yay. 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 All right. Yeah. Unanimous consent, Greg. Yep. Do I have any nays or noes? None. Okay. All right. So um, I will pass his application for the board to uh, uh, Sarah. Now, Sarah, a quick uh, question I have on these. Do I need to carbon copy the mayor or the uh, city administrator on these, or do I just send them directly to you? Uh, you can send them directly to me. I share them with them, and then they get put on the agenda if the mayor agrees for council consensus. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay. Um, I will get those to you. All righty. So now the next things that I have listed here on the uh, under new business, as you can see, we definitely have a lot of different things. And what I was hoping to do was talk a little bit about each topic and get everybody's um, opinion on uh, what maybe has been done in the past or where you think we should go in the future with it. And also I wanted to kind of try to do a little prioritizing. Um, I mean, we can certainly take on you know, 25 different projects and, and try to get all of that stuff done. But I think if we figure out what is the most important and we work with um, the uh, uh, public works director and city council to get some of these things done, if they require funding or studies or any of those types of things. So I'm hoping that uh, once we're done talking about them, maybe we could kind of try to prioritize them if, if you're willing to do that with me. Um, so the first thing we have is we have the aquatic weeds. And I know that, that since I've been on the board, this has been such an issue. Um, and not just with um, what different weeds we have and how the different uh, parts of the fresh waterways have different weeds growing in them, but also uh, how to manage them. Um, and I know that there's some 
uh, residents that feel that we shouldn't manage the weeds strictly by just doing the um, uh, treatment with herbicides, but that we should also try to uh, employ some sort of harvesting um, to that. So the first thing that I have on there, which I felt was uh, uh, important to first talk about, and Nick, you brought this up at the last meeting, was the Integrated Aquatic Vegetation Management Plan. And so I figured we probably needed to start with that. And so Nick, if you have a minute, if you could tell us, um, I know you said that one had to be updated or maybe even start from scratch. I can't really remember your exact words on that, but if you could maybe give us a little bit of information on if the city has one and does it have to be renewed and who it would have to go through. Of course, the last time the city uh, adopted a um, integrated aquatic vegetation management plan was 1994. And so when we were applying or, or coordinating with the Department of Ecology for you know, the, those, those grants that we were talking about a couple of months ago, um, they said, hey, well, um, if you had an updated um, uh, aquatic vegetation management plan, then you could qualify for these grants, but you do not. So you have to start with updating that, that management plan. And so the, the basis of that uh, was exactly the same thing that we're talking about today. You know, how do we, how do we manage that vegetation in the waterways? And there's a variety of different ways to do that. There's the chemical control, there's the uh, mechanical control, and then there's the biological control. And so that's, um, I believe that plan is, is one of the steps that was um, kind of the, the initial catalyst for uh, putting grass carp out there. Uh, at least that's the oldest documentation that I've seen. Um, I'm sure there, there might be older stuff out there, but in any case, um, that's a starting point. Now, uh, that is funded, um, you know, the, was it the last council meeting, I think it was after our, um, after our last meeting, uh, council did end up approving a, a stormwater rate adjustment that did address a couple of these things. And so this is one of the talk documents that was included in the funding uh, adjustment. So um, there's 65,000 that is, is planned or appropriated or, or planned to be appropriated for this aquatic plant management update. So um, Obviously, you know, the, the key piece is, is that we're going to have to kind of follow the quote unquote guidance from the Department of Ecology. Uh, but I, I think it, it will blend well with, uh, you know, some of the other information that's, that's lower on the list here as far as, you know, what does the, the water quality look like from a pH standpoint, from a DO standpoint. Um, you know, and so all of those are a function of how well the plants are going to grow or not grow. So, I think that's a, a very high priority, um, you know, to, to move forward with. Um, so that's, that's kind of the background. The bottom line is, is that um, I, I think that this document does provide some returns uh, or return on investment, meaning we're, we're going to put money towards it. And hopefully what it will do for us in, in the long run is provide opportunities for uh, applying for grants. Yes, they are competitive, so it's not a guarantee, but, you know, the, that will provide the opportunity for at least competing for grants, um, you know, to facilitate either you know, uh, the, the chemical vegetation control or, or you know, pennywort harvesting or um, any number of, of funding programs that the Department of Ecology offers. Okay, so the $65,000, uh, that has been um, set aside to fund this? That was what was identified in the, in the rate evaluation. Now, I, mm -hmm. I, I have to go back and double check to see if we formally address that. I don't believe we actually have formally addressed it, um, but I, I'm not 100% certain because I, I have a vague recollection that the motion to approve the budget was to approve it including the other elements that were approved and, and uh, that, that meeting. So uh, hopefully it's not muddy, um, but I, I think the elements that were incorporated into the, the stormwater rate adjustment are very clear. It's just a matter of 
when are we going to have the budget authority to move forward with that, whether it's right now or in a couple of months. I, I, that I don't know yet. Okay. Now, this management plan, that's not something that somebody in the city does? Is that something that, since you're talking about the 65000 this is something where a, uh, a company would have to come in and do this? How, how does this work? Yeah, very similar to what you guys were just talking about with the membership application. You know, it, it's a matter of, you know, getting the right people to, to facilitate the right evaluations. And so, you know, my background and, and Robert, our city engineer's background, um, while we have a, a little bit of knowledge as it relates to water quality, um, the expertise, I think, is a, a, a different level altogether that we're looking for to facilitate this. And then you compound it with uh, our current workload. Um, it, it's very tough to, to mash more stuff into it. So utilizing uh, a professional organization or an environmental um, firm to, to provide that assistance, you know, it's not only are we going to be looking at, um, you know, we'll say higher quality information, you know, coming out of the report. Uh, we're also going to have, um, you know, that the depth and breadth of, that those people are going to have experience all over the state, maybe even all over Western United States. I, I don't know. Um, so the process to go through that is, is that, you know, we'll, we'll put a uh, request for proposals together. We'll solicit uh, or advertise for, um, you know, interested parties, those interested parties will put together proposals uh, the, the will score the proposals and then uh, initiate contract negotiations and then take it to council for contract authorization. So given, given, um, you know, the fresh waterways board uh, or fresh waterways boards interest in the waterways, I would assume that you guys would want to be part of that scoring process. Um, do you guys have any objections being a part of that scoring process? No, oh, absolutely. We would want to be part of it. Gotcha. Not a problem. Now, that's not something, you're not talking about the same type of um, commission that was, and that, that may not be the right word either, but that was done for the North End Grand Canal where there was different people who showed up along with the uh, landscape folks uh not something like that you're talking about right this is more of a uh we'll call it an environmental review document you know for lack of better words mm -hmm. um what's going on in the system and how do we address it and so you know i imagine there's going to be biologists you know potentially environmental en engineers involved um you know and so we're going to be we're going to be looking for you know specific professionals that you know have the type of experience to address you know, the, the vegetation problem that we have as opposed okay. to landscape architects and that sort of stuff. But it's, it's still going to be, you know, professional individuals and, and contracting through a company. And, and so that is exactly what I was, what I was really kind of meaning was about when you asked about Fresh Waterways Advisory Board being part of it, this wouldn't, it's not where you would bring in just, X amount of city residents to be part of this uh, group of people to sit around and talk and discuss this. If you're right, I mean, it's, it's not that type of thing. Correct. Or at least that's, that wasn't my intent. Um, okay. You know, we can push it that way, but I think it will be less functional because the money won't go as far yeah, by doing exactly. it that way. That was, that was my point. Exactly. Exactly. The more, yeah. So, um, okay. Now, it, do you think that that is something that would be able to be done in 2021? That part, I don't know yet. Um, you know, we've, we've got other, other pressing priorities right now. Um, I think I'm, I'm more likely to, to push on the stormwater master plan. Um, especially after, you know, the number of phone calls we fielded this morning. Um, I don't know about everybody else's driveways, but there was a lot of people that were uh, calling and complaining about, you know, water not going to places where it should. 
And so um, I think that knowing that that's going to be a really big document, that's probably going to be our, our principal focus. Um, but I, I, I can't definitively rule out the, the aquatic management plan update just yet. I understand that. I would say, again, just as me speaking for myself, uh, board members, please feel free to you know, give your opinions here. But I think that this is, is actually probably the most crucial thing that we can do for the fresh waterways is, is to get somebody to come in here and figure out what is going on with these waterways. Because I think that there's so many other determinations that are based upon um, the weed. Um, and obviously the more that we do the herbicide treatment and they're just becoming biomass at the bottom of the waterways, um, I think maybe the more we will probably have, um, you know, we're just going to go year after year of doing the same thing. Um, so if there is another way to do that, um, I, I think we're probably all open to listening to that, but, um, I definitely think that, uh, that this has to be a high priority. And from there, we can make the decisions on, um, on other things, the things that we're going to talk about here in a few moments. Um, so that's just sort of my take. So uh, board members, do any of you have anything you'd like to say about the uh, integrated aquatic vegetation management plan? Bob, Phyllis, Grant? Well, Doug Dorling has been managing our waterways for nearly 20 years. He is, he is a biologist. He treats most of the lakes in Oregon, Washington, and Northern California. He knows weeds. He knows habitat. I, I would not be opposed to having him on our list of consultants, and maybe that's all we can do this year is get him to do a, a review of our waterways and give us some good scientific knowledge and what's going on out there if we can't get to the whoever the big firm representatives might be i'm, I'm glad you brought that up that's uh he actually did an update in 2006 but i don't think it was ever submitted to the department of ecology and so you're exactly right he does have the capability of upgrading uh that management plan as well good Okay, that's good to know. Phyllis, do you have anything on this subject? No? All right. Grant, do you have anything on the subject? Uh, no, but uh, sort of a, a first on the floating boat right here, we might have some opinions that might be beneficial. Like right now, the penny wart is receded back to a very minimum. And it would be a select time to pick it out and get rid of it. And it might be a, a tactic that we might ask about the other weeds. When, when is the best time to attack them and get a plan? Good yeah. point. Yes. Yes. Um, and um, actually, while you are on that, Grant, um, I know uh, Greg and I, we you know, last couple of years, we went out at this time, January, February, and March, and we saw how the penny wart would just start with just a little bit, and then it would just, you know, when, Greg, typically almost beginning of April to mid-April would just really kind of get out, start getting out of control, right? Yeah. Yep. So, so um, I say that because if you want to get more time out on the boat, especially since I, the boathouse is closed, so... We're, we're going to be reopening probably March-ish, maybe beginning of April time frame. Um, but between now and then, you want to take the boat out, give us a holler, and, uh, you know, uh, I'll drag Maria out there, too. She can uh, help uh, get some of those weeds out because I definitely want to get ahead of the penny ward as much as we possibly can. So, Greg, do you have anything about this particular topic? Uh, no, you pretty much covered it, the whole biomass thing. Um, it, it, I, just logically to me, I, I, I'm, I'm not a biologist, but uh, it just seems to me the more dead material we add to the bottom, the more it's going to feed the algae, more it's going to feed other weeds. So, yeah, this uh, definitely, I think, is pretty high on the list. 
Okay. All right. So, uh, Nick or Scott, do you guys have anything you want to ask or add? No, not at this, not at this moment. This is, uh, this is sort of more in the, uh, a, a little discussion on herbicide treatments and things along those lines that I'm, uh, I'm not an expert in. Gotcha. Nick, do you have any uh, last things to add on the management plan? No, I, I obviously I'll, I'll keep you guys up to speed as to kind of what the game plan is once I, you know, kind of forecast out, forecast out what our workload looks like for the next couple of years. Okay. And do you have a copy of the 1994 one? Is that something that I can get online or you can send to me? Yeah, I, I thought I did, but I'll, I'll make sure to send it over again. Okay. Um, Alrighty. And also the 2006 thing that, that Doug Dorling did. I might have that, but if you could send that as well, I'd appreciate it. No problem. Thank you, Doug. Uh, uh, thank you, Nick. All right. So next we have the harvesting, the equipment, manpower, and funding. Now, the reason why I put this here was I really kind of wanted to get a better understanding of exactly what our harvester, um, you know, is that something that we can bring online and use? Um, also, maybe kind of connect that dot that you that we talked about at the last meeting, Nick, where you said, well, maybe we you could have one of your uh, public works guys come over and look at it to see what needs to be done. But I wanted to have a little bit of discussion about the equipment part. Um, so, Grant, what uh, you're the harvesting guru? I've got some uh, pictures of the harvester in action. Uh, maybe I'll. Uh, See if I can get them online so everybody can see how it works. But it's unique to other harvesters because it's uh, it doesn't thrash the weeds and spread them all over and reseed them. It captures captures them as soon as it cuts them, and uh, then it needs a system of uh, pulling it out of the water. And we used to do it with a flatbed on a on a. Uh, a, a boat trailer and then the city would pick it up beside the road but uh, it's unique that uh, it's it works like 100 100% of the time it doesn't have to haul the weeds anywhere it puts them in bags and then any little 12 foot boat can take them to the exit point and that the the drawback is like twofold is it's not capable of managing all of the lake system it's just not big enough it's just too big a job it can do like passages for navigation and stuff like that and the it's slow and the uh it needs a, a better transmission than what it has right now to make it more reliable and if if we get a better transmission for it and we get all three cutters working, uh, it will chew its way through any clogged uh, bog of weeds, whether it's pennywort or Elodea, it'll chew it up and it'll put, I mean, it'll cut it, it won't chew it up, it'll cut it and then it'll put it in the bag and get it out of the ecosystem. And so I'll see about putting those photos online so you can see better how it works. What is it uh, cutting with, six foot, eight foot? It's got, uh, let's see, it's got one eight foot cutter and it's got two six foot cutters, one on each side. So it will literally cut a, uh, a 10 by uh, whatever uh, path in its, in its way. And it can be adjusted for depth down to about, oh, I don't know, five, six feet. And so it could just, it'll just eat a, a passage through a, a clogged waterway. And it'll leave behind all the weeds and bags to be removed. Okay. Have you ever harvested, say, just the center of Grand Canal? Uh I have harvested into 
uh, bell system mm -hmm. up Grand Canal into the bell system. And uh, I've, it's been so thick in the bell system in, in, in the opening that I turned the engines off and we've just hand pulled all the weeds in the front mm. and we sat in the same spot for an hour just pulling weeds in it was so thick okay that i only had the bottom cutters working trying to uh prove out the little transmission and but it's not satisfactory yet if we can get all three transmissions and cutters working it will chew a 10-foot hole through uh any clogged uh, waterway in no time at all. All right. When was the last time you used it? <laughs> been years. Oh, it's been years ago. And it's been uh, sitting idle. And so we decided to take the, uh, the the harvester portion of it off and use it more of a utility boat. And it's uh, worked well, is that? Oh, so one of the utility boats that you have over there that we use, yep. that's it. And you just attach this harvesting yes. equipment to yes. it. Which one? Is it the number one or number two boat? Number one boat, okay. yeah. All right. All right, interesting. The uh, number one boat is a catamaran, and it's got uh, plates. The deck plates lift up, mm -hmm. and we store nets underneath the deck. And in the center in the front, there's a paddle wheel that, sucks all the weeds in and shoots it down a slough that's underneath. And then the uh, the cutters are at the front of the apron that traps all the weeds. So as it cuts them, they're trapped by this uh, apron and it's sucked in with the paddle wheel and it's forced into a, a bag. And the bag is closed off and removed from the waterway so it takes the mass out of the water okay bags it, reusable bags are reusable perfect and we have uh we can have stored on the boat probably about three or four bags okay so the, the minute you use one bag and you break it loose and another boat just uh, it floats free mm -hmm. and another boat snags it takes it ashore You've got three more bags you could roll out and uh, just continue working. But also you could use the number two boat as taking the bags, yep. sort of floating around, taking the bags until you get a whole bunch of them and then get those over to a boat ramp or wherever yep. where the city could come and pick those bags up. Yep. Now, okay, all righty. So that also brings into the point that we've talked a couple other times and Alicia has been great in giving us those couple of different properties that may be able to be used throughout the area. Um, so when we're talking about harvesting, it's not just a matter of getting the equipment into working order, but we also have to have the manpower, which uh, Nick may be able to provide, may be able to provide. Uh, um, but then we also have the funding aspect of it if things break, you know, or to get the fuel. So where does that funding come from? Yeah, the right now, it, uh, the gas has been just, I, I bought the gas. It doesn't use very much gas. Oh. But the, uh, the big drawback is having access to the shoreline uh -huh. to get the weeds out of the water. Right. And so... But the boat launches would work. The boat launches right. would be the only one. Well, especially since we have the two boats, again, we could take those bags, um, put them on the other boat, zip over yep. to wherever we yep. feel is the right place, you coordinate that with the city so they know we're, we're going to be dumping that stuff. Yep. Now, is that something that we can, you can just, I've never seen these bags. I need to get over and look at this. But is this something where just a couple of folks can, take the weeds out of the bag and then you take the bag back to the boat or do you have to, or is this like some well, serious heavy lifting? Yes. You don't, you don't lift. Okay. What you do is you uh, have a boat trailer. It's got a special, like a Teflon deck on it and it's got a big tailgate that drops down and mm. you, you get this in the water and then 
the the tongue is equipped with an electric winch. Oh, okay. And it All pulls right. the bag up on the uh, the Teflon mm -hmm. uh, bed, and it slides very easily. And then you pull the boat trailer out, put it up near the road, mm -hmm. and then that unzips. And then you have to, the hard part is to uh, lift the net and roll it so that all the weeds come out on the road or next to the road. And then you fold it back together, sew it back together again, mm -hmm. roll it up, and just take it back out to the boat. Okay. All right. Hey, Grant, I had a quick question. Do, are, are there any lifting lugs or, or lifting points on the bags where we could use uh, an excavator or a backhoe, for example, to lift the bags and dump them out? The the nets are poly, and there is uh, like about a, oh, say about a 9 poly line that goes around the perimeter. And if you have a, uh, like a, uh, a fork on the loader, you could maybe stab the bag and then lift the whole bag up. That's a possibility because... I know for Elodia, as you lift it up, the water comes off and it loses its weight. If you try to jerk it up, then you're going to be in trouble. But if you pull it up slowly, the water goes out and it just gets light. And uh, the pity word, I don't know about that. That seems to retain the water. But the Elodia, that uh, as you lift it out, it just dries up. So it's certainly worthwhile if you have like uh, prongs on the on the front of the loader that are like about oh maybe one inch or less you could like stab the bag and then you could lift it out yeah our unfortunately our forks aren't that thin but um you know definitely shackles and chains might work too definitely something so to kick around Okay. Um, well, Nick, on the last meeting that we had, I know that you had uh, made a quick comment about maybe somebody uh, from your uh, department coming over and taking a look at that. Is that something that we could get um, one of your guys and Grant, you know, because uh, Grant, is it over at your place or is it over at uh, Barn? It's over at my place. Okay. So what yeah, what I what that? I we know stand with this. Yeah, what I would do is is I'd just have our our mechanic take a look at it. Um, you know, he's super knowledgeable about that sort of stuff. So I'm sure he could help find a solution. And so it's just a matter of you know getting a date and time that's going to work for you guys, and we can we can make that work. All right. So Grant, you want them just to give you a call? Yep, help give you a call on my cell phone. It's uh, 360-710-0991. Got it. Great. All right, Greg, do you have anything about, uh, that you'd like to talk about with the harvesting, the harvester? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I, I, oh, Phyllis, I'm sorry. No, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I stay away from that. Well, I'm just wondering, Grant, if you have an estimate of how much it's going to cost to get this up and running. Just a wild guess. It'll take more elbow grease than money right now. Uh, the only money will be into upgrading some weak spots, one of the transmissions. And then I've got a, a couple uh, pulleys I, I think need to be upgraded. Uh, but the uh, it'll be more elbow grease than anything. All right. And then also, I mean, I hear what you say that you go out and get your own fuel uh, or you pay for the fuel, but I, I don't think that uh, individuals should be doing that. That's just my take on that. I think that um, we're going to have to work with uh, – um, well, the corporation has um, has something. Maybe we could talk with the corporation, but I don't know, Nick. What do you think about um, um, if they're 
how how would we be able to get funding for parts or for fuel in order to do this? Because it sounds to me like maybe some of the uh, manpower would come from the corporation or the advisory board. So, um, you know, just kind of spitballing. Is there something that you could, um, that we would be able to do with the city on that? Well, for starters, I mean, we, first things first, we've got to find out what, what it's going to take to get this baby running again. Right. So, okay. uh, from, from there, then we'll have a better understanding of, you know, how we're going to be able to make this work. And then, you know, fuel's relatively okay. cheap. Um, the, the toughest part that I'm going to have is that pennywort harvesting was specifically not funded, um, in, in this biennium. So, um, uh, I, I don't know how I'm going to make this work just yet. So I'll have to kind of think about it and, and see what sort of support that, that we're capable of providing. Ultimately, you know, I know that it's a major benefit to the city, to the community. And so I want to find a way to, to figure out how to make this work, but I can't, I can't commit to anything just yet. Sure. No, no, I understand that. I just, you know, again, I'm just trying to figure out where we stand on all these different things. Um, but just so you know, the, the actual harvesting uh, that, that they've done in the past, they weren't harvesting the pennywort. That was the Elodea and the milfoil, just the Elodea. So this isn't the pennywort. This isn't the floating topical weed. This is the weeds that grow from the bottom up. That's what this harvester does. The pennywort, when I had said that a little bit earlier, that's something that we can go out on one of the work boats and we take that out and we just kind of get, uh, you know, sort of pitchforks or some other utility and we pull it up on the dock. But this per this particular topic on the harvesting, that is for the Elodea, that crazy stuff that's growing throughout the entire canal system. It, it will work on pinning work too. It will, right. Yeah, but if pinning work takes over a canal, it'll either hold through it. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. All righty. So, so, oh, we didn't yes. understand what we, what we took out. Say again? Well, if Penny Ward isn't funded, but the other is. Oh, yeah. No, no yeah. that's why I brought that. Yes. Yeah, Thank well, you, Phyllis. We didn't understand what kind of weed we were Yeah. Now. Yeah. So we were talking about milfoil. Yeah. I'm sorry, the Elodea, um, Nick. Yeah. So can I ask a silly question? Oops, I'm sorry. Yeah, go go right. In, yeah, go right ahead. Be silly. Well, I, for whatever reason, I was under the impression that we wanted to avoid mechanical harvesting for the most part, except for you know the, those topical type weeds, and from the simple fact that traditionally it's just going to mulch it up and it's it's going to magnify the problem. Um, it, it'll solve the problem temporarily, but it'll, it'll magnify it in the long term. No, not this one. This is unlike any harvester you've seen. This cool. This this harvester cuts it, traps it, puts it in a bag, and it's taken out of the water. Uh, it's not like a lot of harvesters where it uh, it thrashes it, pulls it up on a conveyor belt puts it up in a hopper or bed or something, and then it has to go to shore and then offload it. And uh, it's so much more efficient. And it does not uh, have near the weeds escape as a traditional harvester. Perfect. Well, I, I, could, I could see, Nick, maybe where why you asked that question is because many times, um, I know myself, I have said, hey, let's get out there and harvest the pennywort. Um, and um, especially since the next topic on the agenda is herbicide treatment, this can kind of be a little bit of a, a segue into that, was as I was trying to just figure out a way to do less herbicide treatment. And I thought um, the pennywort really is, other than it just being crazy heavy, it's very, very heavy um, until it... Um, sort of, uh, you know, all of the water uh, drains out of it after about two or three days, and then it's, it's quite uh, manageable. But 
Um, that's something that I had talked about, and even you and me, Nick, many times just on one-on-one -on -one conversations about the penny wart. Um, but for this particular, when I was when I brought up the harvester, I was not thinking penny wart. I was thinking the Eladia, which is something that you cannot pull out with a rake, a uh, pick, you know, or anything like that. Um, you actually have to have this, at least as best as I can see from and listening to what everybody's done in the past, is, is it's either going to be herbicide or it's going to be some heavy-duty harvesting machine in order to harvest that uh, Eladia. So um, I'm sorry if I kind of confused those two, um, those two weeds when it came to harvesting. I'm on board. I get it now. I appreciate the okay. clarification. Yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. So on the herbicide treatment, um, just something, again, bringing it here at the first meeting of 2021, we already know that we're going to get these weeds back. We already know that we do not have capability of getting rid of the parrot feather, the milfoil, the elodea, without doing some sort of herbicide treatment. So um, I guess it's something that we need to start talking about of when would be a good time to, um, and this is where it kind of starts, Nick, in your, uh, your request or proposal, is we need to figure out what the steps are going to be. Can we just dial up Doug Dorling, or do we need to go through a request for proposal? What is the way forward so that we could get that um, study done um, or his um, sonar in the water to uh, show us where the weeds are uh, bad versus not much and then go forward with uh, an herbicide treatment plan. So what is the first step in this? The first step, you hit the nail on the head, is actually the RFP. And so uh, that's something that I need to get done this month uh, is to you know, prep and kick the RFP out the door. Uh, the, the, the basics of the RFP, and actually, I, I want to say I started a little bit in December. Uh, I haven't gotten anywhere near finished yet. But the, the basics is just effectively going to be to match what, what Doug has done for the last uh, 16 years or 14 years, um, which is – come out, facilitate a survey, uh, provide a few options for, you know, control uh, measures. Um, and the thought process was, is that, and I think this is kind of where I got hung up last time as I'm talking through this and it, some flashbacks are coming back. There might be an option to embed the integrated vegetation management plan into that. And so um, I guess, since I'm bringing that topic up, um, you know, that is an option um, that, that we can blend those two together. Um, the other option is, 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 you know, keeping them separate and independent. That way we get, you know, somebody that's, that's actually thinking in, in a different light, meaning they have no dog in the fight. They're not going to get paid for, you know, chemical applications or other applications. They're just, you know, doing what they think is environmentally best. Um, you know, and, and to keep those separate. But to answer the question, first things first, yes, the RFP process is, is the way we have to go. Um, so we'll go through that RFP process. And again, very similar to the IA, uh, VMP is uh, you go through the RFP process, you score them uh, based on the evaluation of the scoring, then you go ahead and negotiate uh, with the, the person that's uh, most qualified and from there, then we we'll go through the council authorization process. And so my goal is, is to have all of that done and buttoned up by, in, in a perfect world, March. Um, and then that way, you know, we can be scheduling uh, the, the review and hopefully application for the, the site survey and application um, in late May, early June. I don't know if we can go much earlier than that or if there's a huge benefit to doing that. But, you know, personally, my goal is, is I will want to hit the, the, the vegetation earlier. And it goes back to the conversation that we've said a couple of times already. Uh, 
the later in the season we hit it, the more bias there is that is dying off. And that, you know, I think does contribute to the dissolved oxygen issues that we may be having. So, uh, and the, the, um, the, the biomass buildup. So the earlier we hit it, the better it off, the better off it is. But all right, because I, I, I facilitated that segue. Um, what do you guys think about uh, blending the, the vegetation management plan with the, the treatment contract? I think this is your bailiwick if you call that one. But I did have a question, sort of along the same lines. Since Doug has been doing this for nearly 20 years, and I think with, with good results, there's no such thing as a preferred contractor where we don't have to go through the, the long RFP pr proposal thing. We've never done one before. We have. Um, it was 2006 when Doug got it. <laughs> so um, because we haven't over the last 14 years doesn't mean that we've been doing it the right way. And so that's the, the, the crux of the issue is, is that we need to make sure that we're doing it the right way. And that's, that's why I'm facilitating it this way. So um, now don't get me wrong, Doug's provided great service to us. Um, you know, I, I think that he's he's obviously got a very good shot, presuming that he put something in. Um, you know, if if he doesn't put anything in, well, then you know, I guess that that identifies the direction we need to go. But um, you know, he and I have made, maintained communication, you know, throughout the winter, and so uh, I, I, to be honest, I'd be shocked if he didn't put a, put an RFP in or put his his proposal in. Does this uh, when you're doing an RFP? Does it uh, and the selection is it based off the lowest bidder or is it based off of who uh, the city believes would do the best job? Normally, proposals are based off of the most qualified, and that's the architecture and engineering approach. Now, when you when you're talking about something like this, now it's it starts to get a little weird and nebulous because it's not a public works project or, or a project, you know, uh, subject to prevailing wage, like a, a small works project or something along those lines. So if it were a public works project, in that case, we would be obligated to take the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. In a request for proposals, generally speaking, your approach is to take the most qualified person and negotiate with that most qualified person. And then if you cannot come up with uh, an agreement with that most qualified person, then you completely discard that uh, proposal, and then you start negotiating with a second qualified person. So, um, okay. to answer the question, bottom line is it's you know mostly you know who can do the work the best based on the proposal information. Okay, that's okay. That, that's good to know. And is this something that has to be done? every year or once you put the RFP out, is there some sort of contract where it's for, for three years, five years, whatever? I think my approach is really going to be based on the budget cycle. So I'm going to, I'm going to shoot for a two year window. And then that way I have to do it every two years. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, all righty. So, um, does anybody else, any other board members, have any uh, comments, questions, concerns on the herbicide treatment and the next uh, thing, the next step, which would be uh, Nick working on a request for proposal? I have a comment on it. Um, my concern is if we get someone out here evaluating our weed situation in March, they don't start growing until April or May. And that's what has always determined when our treatment normally is, which we have always held off until after the 4th of July weekend to make sure that the waters are safe for people who are here during that weekend. Um, treatment in May and June may be too soon. Well, you could do the survey. The, well, yeah, the survey, 
Well, I think it's when like, Nick was talking about March, he was talking about having the RFP completed, the, the yeah. process itself completed. Um, Is that right, Nick? That's what you were shooting for when you said March was just the RFP, not the actual uh, survey and plan, right? No, well, for March, I want the contract executed. And so that's that's kind of my target there. Now, the survey, you know, Doug and I had, had spoken, and I think, you know, survey uh, in potentially late May, uh, early June, uh, followed very shortly by uh, application. You know, Doug was, was 150% on board with that. You know, he's, he said it made a lot of sense because of the biomass reduction. And when you say, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music with terms. When you say contract executed, you mean RFP completed, selection made for the uh, contractor, and an agreement to move forward. That's the execution of the contract? That would be council authorizes us to sign the contract. That's So my goal oh, is, okay. yes, all of those complete. Okay. And then council says, yes, go ahead and execute the contract. And in a perfect world, that'll occur in said so far with one proviso. Before the survey is done, Doug won't know how many acres need treating, what type of chemicals he needs to use. Uh, so the contract will have some holes in it at that point. There's a lot of unknowns yet to be determined. Yeah, and that's, that's the tough part of a, a contract like this is that you, you can't specifically identify exactly what we're going to be doing until the survey is complete. So you're exactly right, which is part of the difficulty in, in scoring it based on cost. So that's partly why we're going with the, the, the other method. Okay. Okay. And so really with Doug doing it based on some sort of, or maybe over the last five or six year historical um, that would be able to be, uh, enough for council to authorize the execution. What if he then does the survey and comes back and goes, well, plan B is we have to do this, uh, this or it's suggested that we do more acreage of the fresh water waves. Uh, is that you would then have to go back to council to ask for an amendment, is that correct? Generally speaking, yes. Um, but likely what I'd do is I'd, I'd coordinate a request with council that, you know, they authorize utilization up to, you know, the maximum amount scheduled for this year, which I, I want to say was 50 or 55,000. And then that way it gives us the flexibility and, and it doesn't kill us on time. Okay. All right. Well, if you recall, the proposals typically have been one, two or three different options, depending on, how many acres he treats, what chemicals he uses, and, and what the survey results show. So I'm sure that we'll get some sort of a tiered proposal again that will at least give us a bracket around what the total cost is going to be. Yeah. This is Phyllis. Also keep in mind that the proposal for the 2021 may be higher than last year's because we did our treatment late and usually around September he comes back and does spot treatments to get the spots that are still growing out of control and that second treatment did not happen this year. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. All right. Nick, do you have any follow-up to, or uh, before I do that, Greg, do you have anything you'd like to add? Nope. Grant, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no. Just a little side note. The lake is up right now, and a bunch of the logs that have been uh, put at the edge of the lake in the passages are now floating. I've seen a couple of the logs floating down the canal. Oh, some boy. small ones, some big ones. Ooh, fun. Yeah, one oh. dock is almost ready to go underwater. <laughs> yeah, we've seen several of those. 
well, maybe we'll have to do a repeat of what we did last year and pull out some of those. That was fun. Um, <laughs> all right. So um, I'm sorry, just uh, Nick um, or Scott or um, Alisa, do you guys have anything you want to add on the herbicide treatment before we move on? I do not. Sorry, I was muted. No, it's pretty much covered. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Nick, you good? Yep, I'm all good. That was great information. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so what I have next was the, uh, I'll do the next two, water study and water health testing. And I wanted to get that on here because I think that that is definitely an important aspect when it comes to the fishing, um, the algae, and um, of course, you know, it also uh, what we're doing with the treatment of the weeds and those becoming more biomass and all of that. But I really wanted to put those on here just as a uh, quick talk about. Uh, but it sounds to me like maybe those are two things that could be included in the integrated aquatic vegetation management plan. Is, is that something that could be included, uh, Nick, um, in that plan? They were included in the 94 plan. Um, the tough part is, is I don't know if we're going to have the resources uh, to, to be able to do that this go around. So we'll have to see kind of how that all plays out. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I believe that those are essential components to, you know, how the plants are going to grow in the water. Okay. Bob, do you have anything? Uh, Greg, do you have anything you want to add when it comes to the water study or water health testing? Oh, uh, no. No. Bob. I guess I will ask one thing. Yeah. In years past, the four of us have gone out and we've spent a day testing various elements of the, of the water chemistry. We did not do that last year, but we have several years of, of history. Is, is it your desire, Nick, that we should continue with that treatment? Yeah, I, I thought we talked about that back in December, um, and, and I never followed up with Bruce to go get copies. I think all I have is the 2016 data. Um, so getting that data, at least the historical data, would be a great start. So I, I need to reach out to Bruce to see if I can't get that. Um, the I guess the second piece of you know continuing the the data acquisition. I feel like it's a, a, a valuable component. Um, the tough part is, is that I don't know, it, without a, a, a QAQC or a quality you know, controller or a sampling analysis plan, uh, there, there can be some questions in, in you know, the, the data. And so, you know, when we see pH readings change dramatically from month to month, were they taken exactly at the same time of day? Um, you know, cause, cause that's going to change based on, you know, the diurnal cycle or, um, so I, I don't know, uh, if, if there are holes that, that can be punched in that. Um, you know, and so that's something that, that we probably want to be super cognizant of. And maybe the thing to do is, is that as, as we start the, the vegetation management plan, maybe that's the time to ask those questions, you know, of, of somebody else and to get their input as well. I, it, maybe you guys had it locked down and, and I just, I didn't know that data, but um, those are just some things that, that I was aware of in the past. So it sounds like there's no reason for us to do water sampling in the near future. We'll just put that on the back burner too. Sure. Okay. I disagree. Yeah, I, I, I've always said, this is Phyllis, I've always said that even though the information wasn't being used at that time, we needed to have a continual history of it showing that it is being done. And unfortunately, this year, it did not happen due to various several health reasons for people. But um, I think that starting now, in the 2021 year that we should really continue on doing it. Um, okay, so what I was going to add um, was this is something 
where Joe Hubachek is very interested in. And um, he's a retired guy and he loves being out in the water. And uh, we actually had a pretty lengthy conversation about this. And I hear what you're saying, Nick, about, um, you know, where someone would be able to punch holes in. It was one of the things that Joe and I talked about was, are they are are, are they being taken at the same time, the same exact spot, uh, thereabouts? Um, and you know, it sounds like something that he really kind of wanted to take on. I don't want to put his name out there; he's not even actually on the board yet. But I just wanted to give everybody who's part of this that we do have a possible board member that. Uh, would like to take this on and also work with uh, Bob, Phyllis, and Bruce on what you guys were doing. One of the things that he did ask me was about, do we have the proper meters to do the different testings? And um, I think the meter that was used was, did that belong to Doug? And you, no. that is something that we have. The city owns that. Do, do, does somebody, do we have that in our possession? Bruce has it. Bruce has it. Okay. And there was another one of those things. And Nick, I don't know if you guys already have one, but do you have a dissolved oxygen con uh, concentration meter? It's in that machine. It's in that machine. It all does everything? Yeah. Okay. Because those were a couple of things that, that Joe had asked about. So, all right. What I'm going to do with this is I'm going to go ahead, and if everybody agrees, I am going to move this to a future meeting when Joe – if he does become, uh, if he does get on the board and he can talk about this and how he did this at other places and how it benefited and how he did it and uh, it seemed to work for him in Oregon. Um, so board members, you guys all okay with me doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm on board. Yeah. Greg? Yes. I can yes. say that I didn't do it on the same day each month because it was weather dictated. Okay. It was not done at the same time necessarily. Mm -hmm depend on weather dictated sure but it was done pretty much in the same same area, area. yeah we use gps markers to drop it. okay all right yeah i had told them that i'm sure that it was done that way i didn't realize it wasn't the same time or same day but um uh yeah okay so that also goes a uh, good segue into the algae testing equipment um did you get that uh information nick so that we could see about the city possibly ordering that no i have not so uh, i actually oh. tried to contact doug about that information okay and um i was before christmas and he he must be off <laughs> he has not answered me so I was going to reach out to Bruce and have Bruce call him okay. to get the information. Now, what, him, him and Bruce have a really good. Was this the same, the algae testing equipment, was this the same equipment where Bruce, uh, you, Bob, and myself, we all went and sat down with Nick and the mayor and, and presented yeah. it? Is this yeah. that same stuff? I okay. I all that stuff written down, but I felt like... All right. Uh, Phyllis, you want to know what? In my in my binder of many papers that I have sitting here on my lap, I'll look through. I just might have that, Nick. And if so, I can stop down and bring it to you. I know the manufacturer. That yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was as far as I got with Doug as well, uh, was the manufacturer. And I looked at the manufacturer's website and went, oh, there's a lot of them. So I didn't quite know what to buy. <laughs> that was our problem, too. It was like, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll look through all this stuff, and I'll see if I can uh, find it. But I'll follow up with you, Nick, whether I do or do not find the paperwork, just so that you know where we are with that. But that is something that I think we need to – uh, get moving on before. Uh, there's actually been a couple of patches uh, when I, I when I was out about a month ago that looked a little squirrely. So, um, anyways, might be something to consider. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, one last call. Does anybody have anything about the algae testing equipment you'd like to talk about? Okay. Waterway size, the length, the width, and the depth. And 
I don't know if this is something, Nick, that would be part of the uh, vegetation management plan of when they come out here. Do they also do uh, a true measurement, a survey, if you will, of the, the length, the width, and with sonar, the depth of the waterways? No. <laughs> um, in that may be something to incorporate into the stormwater management plan. Um, the reason being is when you build a stormwater pond, you know, so everybody that's come from the I-5 corridor has seen a stormwater pond. And mm -hmm. the maintenance activities associated with that is, you know, you need to remove the sediment that accumulates on the bottom of that stormwater facility on a regular basis. And so you have all the design information, how big the pond was, you know, what, what were the dimensions when it was constructed and so that you can go back and, and effectively reconstruct it through maintenance procedures. We don't have any of that information as it relates to the canals. Um, they were just dug out. Um, I don't have plans for the canals, what their depths were, what their widths were, what their bottom widths were, um, you know, when they were done in the sixties. And so, um, that may be something that, that proves useful, um, but I'm not quite sure where that fits. I, I don't think it fits into the vegetation management plan. I think it fits better into the stormwater management plan. Now the question is, is, you know, is that something that um, I'll have the funding available for, um, you know, because that likely will get expensive. So um, I, I, I don't have a good answer for that yet. Okay. I think the reason Steve asked that question is that if you look at various city documents and tourism goods, uh, the dimensions range from 23 miles of shoreline to some bigger number. And it's, there's no, no consistency about it. Steve and um, Greg went out and they came up with something that looked about a quarter bigger. Yeah, so we, Greg and I did this completely unscientifically. Greg, you can explain what you use, but I used a, uh, uh, a map that you use in navigation and boating and things of uh, measuring um, the waterways. And this is not the depth. Um, I didn't do the width. I strictly did um, how, what the length of each of them was if I were going to go on a straight line. And I came up with, um, one moment, sorry, 15, I came up with 15.3. Greg, you came up with 16 point what? I don't remember. <laughs> well, I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to say 16.1 because I think it was just like a smidge over 16, but I could be wrong. Um, and my point with that is, is that, um, whether it, as Bob stated, whether it's uh, city tourism, even myself and my business, I've used the word, uh, I've used the phrase 23 miles of freshwater way. Uh, realtors use it. I've seen 23, I've seen 26, I've seen 20. Um, point is, is that there, none of those numbers are accurate. Whether you are doing shoreline or whether you're just doing from point A to point B length, in any of the canals or lakes. And um, so with that also comes, uh, what is the width and what is the depth? And it goes to what you were talking about, Nick, is that the city, we should know what this is. Uh, one, how much is the biomass actually really um, affecting the depth of the waterways? Um, and or even just the sand maybe being uh, moved about, uh, you know, as you're coming uh, out of Lake Menard and into Mars Shallows, uh, that crazy sandbar, which seems to be getting larger. Um, and just so it's the movement down there and how that is affecting um, the, the, quality of yeah, the, the, the quality of the water, the, the, the land mass, if you will, and is it moving about? Um, and so I thought that that would be something that we should probably get as a priority 
and figuring out how to get that done. And I wasn't exactly sure if that could be done through this aquatic vegetation management plan, but you brought up a good point as well, Nick, of having it maybe as part of your overall utility, uh, I'm sorry, your storm drain management plan. Uh, but I think that that's something we need to talk about. We just never have. Um, so Nick or Scott, do you, or even Alicia, do any of you have any um, comments on this? Scott looks I like don't. he froze. Not here. <laughs> okay. Did Did you have any Scott's or, or any any comments? I was going to let you guys go first. No, not in particular. Gotcha. Alicia. No, I don't. Gotcha. No, I I, I think Steve. Ultimately, we're just going to have to see what what we're capable of uh, incorporating into the storm plan because. At the end of the day, we, we know it's a problem and to to figure out how much that problem is going to cost to fix, you have to quantify the problem. And to quantify the problem, you need this basic information, the length, the width, and the depth. So uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do to incorporate that into the storm plan because that to me, I think makes more sense. I hadn't really thought about it yet either. So um, that that to me kind of seems like the, the best path for it. And uh, I guess we'll just have to see how that one plays out. Okay. Um, Greg, do you have anything that you wanted to add on that? 16.38 was the number. Okay. 16.38. All right. Just to so confirm those are the miles? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And that was also based on Google Maps, so for what it's worth. Yeah, so we were um, uh, basically about a mile apart, and we did even these little tributaries, sort of these little runoff uh, that go out of Duck Lake, and you know houses are lined on those as well. So we did we did all that point to point and things. So, um, anyways, that kind of just gives you an idea that you can see that if you're using the term twenty anything twenty ish, it is not an accurate statement. So, um, just something that. Uh, I don't know um, if Nick, if that's something you want to take up to, um, you know, up to the mayor, just to give her a an idea or that we're talking about that. But again, I think that it's something that we do need to know. Um, and uh, this all kind of started with a, a question that was asked by a citizen uh, a few months ago and asked uh, what you know, where the 23 miles came into play. And so, um, anyways. Uh, so just a quick note. Yeah, go ahead, Nick. Just a, a quick note on that. I, I bet you that's something that we can come up with in GIS relatively quickly. And I bet you the difference is, uh, you know, with 23 miles being the, that number that's thrown around, I'd be willing to bet that's the property boundaries of all of the properties and that the water level is a little different than the property boundary or the, the edge of the water. That's always how I thought they measured it. I thought it was measured based on the property boundaries adjacent to the water. I, I, I kind of, I, 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 okay. so I was really bored after, after that meeting we talked about it. So I did Google, I used Google maps again um, and did the measurement around there. I don't have the number, but it was way more than 23. 50 something if I remember correctly. I'll see if I can pick that up. Well, see, and that's a good point. So are you, uh, you know, when you're talking about the measurement, is that measurement complete shoreline? And if it's shoreline, then we know it's not going to be anywhere near 23, no matter how you slice it. Actually, um, I come to think of it, I didn't do property boundaries. I, I did, I included everything, parks, everything. So yeah, that, that may be okay. I, I'm not sure. Ah, okay. Yeah, so that's actually a good point. We're, so whoever came up with this 23, probably way before any of us here, Grant, do you happen to know where the 23 came into play? Um, and um, so 
I don't know. I mean, obviously somebody had it measured at some point and what, what it was that they measured. Maybe they didn't count certain canals or maybe something was an afterthought. I don't know. But um, I, I think that Amber Alert. Yep, sorry. My, my phone's going off Amber Alert. Yeah, we all have that problem, it looks like. And what else it could be seen is yes. our property goes out into Lake Menard about 30 feet for our survey. Oh, okay. So if, if they're using property line as a measurement source, we know that this is going to be wider in reality than what the property line is. Okay. All right. I don't know how often that occurs, but I know it happens in Lake Menard. Okay. Well, Nick, it sounds like something that we probably just need to keep on the on the agenda and we can discuss how best to move forward with it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gotta love Zoom. Um Okay, and so that also goes into the same thing when it comes to the waterways restoration, reclamation, and what I was talking about with that was the depth, the erosion, and the circulation of it all. Um, those two things, Nick, since you're doing the, the uh, storm plan, I don't know if you even had, had thought about adding that last part, the restoration and reclamation to the storm plan. Well, as far as circulation, I think that's a critical piece. Uh, it, you know, when we have, you know, rainfall anywhere in, in ocean shores, I need to make sure that it's getting out. Um, the other thing from a water quality standpoint is, is that those dead end sections, um, in, in a perfect world, I want to, I want to be incorporating stormwater discharges in those dead end sections. Um, or, you know, if we're going to dream reclaimed water there, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think that is a critical component for the stormwater master plan. Okay. And on reclamation, this is Bob again. I just handed Steve a, a large folder. Thank you. That um, one of our previous board members, Joni Arnold, spent the better part of the summer researching this and it is using a vacuum system to get the muck out of the waterways, the old leaves, the, all this other crap. And, and she's got a, a huge folder on it. And um, it, it's at least a place to start about reclaiming or ma maintaining our uh, retention pond here. Um, would you like to see that, Nick? Sure. Definitely something to look at. We use divers. They have long tubes. Uh, they suck the bottom up. They, they have the all screen so you don't end up sucking all the fish out of the lake. And it's then put in bags that need to be stored until some of the water drains out and then they get hauled away. They did compost, I would think. Could sell it to a compost place. Oh, that's a good idea. It's like a we'll, we'll get a copy of that too. Okay, we'll get a copy, Nick. Great, thank you. Um, okay, uh, last that we have on the agenda is the fish study. Um, does anybody know when the actual last fish study was completed? No. No? No, I can't remember when it was. But... I think it was Joe Samuelson who was out here fishing one day and says, I caught sick. <laughs> I think that was a Ross Peter. No, it's Red Peter saying there's no fish. Oh, that's true. Because um, I know that this is definitely a question that uh, some citizens have um, of whether, you know, what type of fish are out there, how many, um, and whether the grass carp are reproducing or not, and all of those kinds of things. So, um, Yes, and it was a, it was an it was another subject that he was quite passionate about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What? Greg, do you have anything to add on that? 
Oh, uh, no. Okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and oh, – I'm sorry. Um, Scott, Nick, or Alicia, do you have anything that you wanted to add on the fish study? No, any I've never even any? seen – I haven't seen any fish study – at all, does anyone have an original one or the, a most recent one? I'd actually like to read, look at it. The last I saw was in this, one of the city offices. I, I have not had one of my own. I just found a, a Fish and Wildlife fish study from 1999 to 2004 that was published in January of 2006. Um, I'm not aware of any newer than that. Um, Nick, you're, you're right. That, I think that was the last one that was done. And last year, we did ask for a study from Fish and Wildlife, and they were going to come out, and then they did not show. Okay. Um, would, would you, Nick, right. would you send that to me just, that of, just so I can just read it, just to be curious to look through it? Yep, and right. All right. That is something that we will keep. Uh, um, as old business, because I know that it's it's something that we we need to be able to answer these questions when uh, you know uh, old or new residents ask these questions um, instead of just telling them to go read a document. I think we need to have a little bit better no. response than that. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and go to public comment. Um, I know we have at least uh, Mr. Williams on the line. Do you have anything that you'd like to uh, comment on, sir? Uh, yeah, Ken, is that possible? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I was just wondering uh, with 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 uh, with Nick. Um, he ta you talked about the budget for the aquatic weed control this year to be, I mean, to be fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars. Is that for this year? or is that for the biennial? Because there was no new money put in by the council when they, when they raised the um, storm drain rate for anything to do with aquatic, aquatic weed as we do every year. And I believe there was 145,000 for the biennium in that uh, line item called um, professional services. And I think that's probably where it is. So I'd like to ask is is your estimate and you said that you didn't weren't sure 50 to 55 is that for this year uh not for the biennium because for the biennium it takes a big chunk of the 145 and I guess my other question is um I've never I don't recall ever seeing a um contract for uh the aquatic weeds brought before the council am I missing something here I don't recall ever seeing one in the past so is this something new maybe it has been done I just don't recall and like to hear that. And the last thing I want to say is I've, I'm the one that asked the question about the 23 miles, of, uh, oh, maybe, maybe six, eight months ago. And the reason is, is because you keep hearing we have 23 miles of fresh waterways. No one ever says, is it the length, the width, the perimeter, whatever it is. So I wanted to know, but that number is, is burned into everything, including I'm sure the, uh, the uh, shoreline master plan is burned into all of the city marketing information and it's always referred to 23 miles, and and I always have estimated that was a that was a perimeter, but it's always just unqualified 23 miles. So if it's really a 16 or 20, that's a big difference, and that number is burned in everywhere. So anyhow, that's my comment on that one. And I would like to hear about the aquatic weeds. Is that covered in the $145,000 item called professional services? And then I'll just uh, go back to listen. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Nick? Yeah, so the, the 50 to 55 is annually. And so you're exactly right. It does eat up a, a very large chunk of that 145 that's allocated for that line item. So um, that was embedded into the budget uh, prior to uh, the, the storm rate modification because we knew it was important. And so that, that was one of the things where we deferred other things so that we could make sure that that was included. So. Um, and then as far as, you know, contracts coming before council, um, I don't believe they have. And, and that's part of the reason why, you know, like I said, just because we've done things the way that we have for a number of years, um, you know, I think the last time it probably was, was 2006, uh, when, when Doug started. So, um, you know, 
part of what I try to do is just make sure that everything is done squarely. And that's exactly where we're going. So that's why we'll end up in front of council this go. Okay, great. Hey, th Thank th you, Nick. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, did that answer your question, Mr. Williams? Do you have any other questions that you'd yeah, like? I think uh, it did, but I'm kind of concerned about this, the 23 miles because that number is burned in everywhere in the city for years. It's in all documentation, in the advertising, marketing information, the shoreline master plan. That's kind of a big error, <laughs> but that's the way it goes, I guess. Thank yep. you. Yes, sir. We are as well, and that's why we have it on here, and we want to try to get all of that resolved. Um, thank you very much. Um, sir, was there any other visitor who came online? There was not, and I did not receive any written comments to read. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do a quick uh, good of the order. We'll start with uh, Bob. I think I'm talked up for today. I have nothing to add. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Phyllis? Uh, um, I'm good. I don't have anything to add. Great. Grant? I hope 21 is a better year. <laughs> <laughs> we all yeah. Here. Cheers to that. Uh, Greg, do you have anything? I uh, know. No. Thank you, sir. Um, all right. Um, Alicia? I don't have anything further. Thank you. All right. Um, Scott? I'll second the 2021 motion, and uh, let's hope this is uh, this is smoother year than we had last year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Nick. No, this is my first day back in two plus weeks, so uh, this is a heck of a crash course. I'm glad you guys put up with me through this meeting. <laughs> uh, um, okay, thank you, Nick. And so for me, what I'd like to say is again, thank you very much, everybody, for bearing uh through this meeting an hour and 40 minutes you know i like to keep them under the hour if possible but i thought we needed to start out 2021 with uh um, a lot of different subjects and figure out where to go with these through the year um and uh, hopefully we'll make great progress all together as a team so with that um it is uh 15 and i adjourn this meeting our next meeting will be february 1st 2021 at 2 p.m. probably on Zoom. All right, you all have a great uh, great month. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Happy New Year. <laughs>